second year of our three-year commitment of a total of $25 million for arts and cultural institutions in our community. Uh, we're here at Road Less Traveled because they were one of the first recipients to actually have completed a project associated with the dollars that were provided last year. Uh, last year, uh, we did approximately $8 million worth of, of cultural grants uh, to various organizations across our community. You'll hear a little bit more about that from uh, Thomas Baines, our Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Environment and Planning uh, in a bit, and we're expecting to do approximately the same uh, this year. We did not intend on doing the full $25 million all at once because we wanted to spread it out to give more organizations an opportunity to benefit from the program. And as you will hear from Scott, it has made a difference. It's made a tremendous difference uh, for Road Less Traveled with regards to the uh, amount of sales that they've been able to do in this beautiful new uh, venue that they have here up front. They were here for a few years with the theater in the back, but they did not have uh, this bar, uh, this reception area. They had a very small entry point, and as a result, they were able to generate much more income for the theater, which of course generates more income for us through sales tax, which is always the hope, is you create a stronger organization, which generate more revenue, and it benefits everyone in the long run. Uh, we are also joined by our Commissioner of the Department of Environment and Planning, Dan Castle, uh, as well as by Legislator Howard Johnson, who you'll be hearing from in just a moment. Uh, when we announced the $25 million capital grant program for arts and cultural institutions, the main goal was to support small to mid-sized organizations that need this type of assistance but often don't get it because they are, uh, the smaller amount is requested or they don't even think about coming to government for it and not moving ahead with projects as a result. It's not unusual for one of the large cultural organizations to come to the county and seek a $7 million uh, grant. So a million dollars, or seven million, seven figure grant, a million dollars or more for some of these very large projects. But sometimes it's only 250,000 to 40,000 that might make the difference for an arts and cultural institution to be able to keep their facility going, to advance their facility for the future. And so when we announced the $25 million grant program, the hope was that we'd be able to provide grants across the whole gamut of the region. And that's what we did last year. And we know there's many more out there that are looking for assistance. So we are opening up the program again today. Today is the first day of the program in which you can actually apply through the Department of Environment and Planning to receive a grant of the $8 million or so that will be roughly uh, provided this year. Uh, we are not stopping organizations who applied last year for a grant and received one if they have a need that could be appropriate. However, we would certainly look to other organizations first to see if we can spread the wealth, so to speak. Uh, we don't want to just continue to do the same project after another. But if there is an organization that did receive funding last year, uh, we're, they're not precluded from applying this year. So we wanted to make certain that information's out there. Uh, this will be reviewed through our traditional capital grant program. Uh, right now, uh, we're beginning the process in which the department heads and legislators are going to meet through the summer to make determinations on how to invest the county's resources in our capital programs. And then at the end of that process, we'll be having special meetings associated with the arts and cultural institutions to provide them uh, a complete and thorough review of their applications so that we feel comfortable that when we make the decision, we've supported projects that not only are real projects that are going to move forward in the future, but that are going to have a positive impact for our community, just like this project did. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Legislator Howard Johnson to talk a little bit more about the process, but also what the legislators are looking for as we move forth in this uh, endeavor. So, Legislator? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just want to start out by thanking the county executive. Executive, uh, thanking his administration, uh, Department of Environment and Planning, Commissioner Castle, Deputy Commissioner Banks. Thank you, guys. This uh, is a game changer for those mid-sized uh, companies that the uh, county executive talked about. This helps to bring them online. This helps to help with infrastructure repairs and things of that nature that will help them to be able to compete. You know, the I believe our mid-sized uh, cultures like this are the backbone of our community. You know, these local artists come here are able to come here, perform, and do the job and, and, and become noticed. Um, we as legislators, this is what we talked about. This is what we want to see, you know, the dollars going to the mid-sized companies. Um, so this is uh, what we've uh, 
work with the uh, county executive administration with to uh, make this uh, make this happen. This is round two of it. The first round was very successful, and I'm believing that round two also will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, legislator. We have an example of what round one did, and that is road less travel. Uh, they were uh, very into the process when we announced the program, and so they were able to move quicker than other organizations who did receive a capital grant, who may now be going forth with the process of doing construction and other types of work. So I thought it was appropriate for us to be here to hear from Scott Barron, the executive director of Road Less Travel, about what impact that capital grant last year had on the organization. Not only did it create a more beautiful space, but my understanding is it generated more revenue for the organization, which is a win for all. So Scott. Sure. Uh, good morning, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, just quickly, this we uh, created this entire theater space in 2018. It was formerly the Baker Shoes Building. And our initial lobby was uh, this basically small corridor here, uh, and you had to enter through a small hallway. Uh, this capital grant allowed us to uh, take over an existing uh, retail space that was at the front here uh, and open it up and turn it into our new lobby and bar. Uh, and also behind this wall also is gonna be our new scene shop, which now we'll all, we, we had a space offsite, so we've been able to consolidate all those things which is gonna help our business and cut costs, et cetera. Um, this is a really exciting project. It was a very ambitious timeline. I wanna thank everybody here for how we were able to uh, move this project along as quickly as we did. Uh, and uh, so far, the results have been fantastic. We wanted to create a top tier patron experience uh, and a place for our patrons to come in and commune before and after a show. Uh, and I think we've really succeeded in doing that. Our bar sales alone, just off the, the, the two shows that we were able to produce in the second half of this season with this bar and lobby, uh, almost quadrupled, quadrupled our sales uh, uh, previously. Uh, so, and now as more of our patrons come through the doors and understand what this experience is gonna be like, we see that growth uh, continuing to grow. Uh, into our 20th anniversary next season. Let me make sure I plug that. <laughs> so uh, we've made it for 20 years and this is a great way to sort of kick off now in preparation uh, of the anniversary season. Okay. And I also wanna thank, uh, hold on, I'm gonna read this because I want to. Uh, through this program, Erie County and County Executive Mark Polencars have continued to be the most important government supporter of arts and culture in our region. Uh, this program is a game changer for small and mid-sized culturals like ours. And um, I just wanna say thank you again. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Scott. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, next, uh, we're gonna present uh, our Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Environment and Planning, Thomas Baines, who oversees the administering of the Cultural Capital Grant Program. Actually, he's got a lot that he oversees. <laughs> we put a lot on his plate in the Department of Environment and Planning in the last couple of years, and they've worked very hard to, uh, to actually uh, come through on a timeline that works for all. So, Thomas? Thank you, thank you. Again, Thomas Baines, Deputy Commissioner of Planning and Economic Development for Erie County. Um, and the question of the day that I know those orgs out there are asking is how do we apply? And today we're happy to say that the application is available online right now. You can visit erie.gov slash cultural capital grant program. Again, erie.gov slash cultural capital grant program. And when you visit our website, what you'll find is, of course, the application, but I think more importantly, um, you'll find a registration link to our virtual information session which will take place on June 1st at 6 o'clock again that is June June 1st at 6 o'clock um, and at that session what we'll do is we'll go through the application line by line we will answer any questions you have we'll talk about eligibility we'll talk about types of projects in the past and what we can look to for the future um, in addition to that you'll have our email address at that website in case you want to email us with questions um, we're, we're really standing, able, willing to uh, answer your questions, take your phone calls, shoot us an email, we're available. And then lastly, I'd like to say that the application closes on July 7th. So there's plenty of time to get your application in. 
but it closes July 7th. So what I would suggest is join us for the, for the information session. Come get some information, learn about the process, learn about the eligibility, gather your documents together, and then afterwards, file your application with us, uh, submit it fully before July 7th, and then uh, we expect to see some wonderful, wonderful projects out there. Just briefly, what we've had in the past is HVAC systems we've addressed, windows, doors, um, renovations, FF&E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So it runs the gamut. From $4,000 all the way up to $925,000 was allocated last year. So um, we're happy that this project is in round two phase, and I know my team is standing by to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. We know just a few dollars can make a big difference for an organization. As Thomas noted, we've seen everything from windows and doors to roofs to this brand new lobby and reception area at Less Travel. And that is the goal, is to support organizations that make a difference in our community, that enrich our lives and create a better quality of life for all. And hopefully, uh, we'll be getting some great applications coming in, as noted, until July 7th. So there are a number of weeks uh, for the organizations to apply. But once that July 7th deadline passes, then it's over because we have to do our review and our allocation. So with that, uh, I'll open it up to any on-topic questions first before taking off-topic and issuing a statement. Well, so of course we built a project budget for the entire renovation and what we thought that that would do for our earned revenue through the course of a season. And uh, uh, by increasing that by basically increasing those bar sales, it helps us pay our rent, it helps us earn our general operating costs, all those kinds of things. It's, it's a huge deal for us. And um, providing an additional revenue source like that, let's say outside of just selling tickets or looking to funders for more grants is uh, always a great way to go. And I will just say quickly that uh, creating that entire patron experience, which this we think really now um, creates for people um, is also going to help our ticket sales, right? So it's a, one thing sort of feeds off of another. Well, I'll, 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 that's funny that you mentioned that because uh, we, we started an improv program, improv comedy program a couple of years ago, and uh, they just did an improv uh, last week, which I came and saw. And I'll tell you, selling a lot of drinks to your bar definitely helps your comedy show. <laughs> so uh, I guarantee you, we're actually gonna continue that and expand that program because now that program actually makes more sense. And I don't mean that just from like, let's go out and have a lot of drinks perspective, but you know, think of the comedy shows you've ever been to, the drinks help, so. Right. Well, I mean, if the, the more money, of course, that we can uh, generate, of course, we, it will help our standards, will help us pay artists, will help all those kinds of things. Is there a competitive or symbiotic type of relationship with all the bigger companies down here on Main Street as, as these are available to sort of everybody down here? Is that going to help the general theater community? Well, we would hope that like people would want to come out and hang out here with, you know, uh, before and after a show and, and uh, you know, Buffalo is a pretty large, uh, small theater community. Uh, so actually, I don't know how to answer that question, but that's the best answer I've got. So primarily, um, as it pertains to eligibility, um, first and foremost, the organization must be in Erie County, of course. Um, and they must be a 501c3 organization. And then lastly, uh, they must be an arts and cultural organization as well. And uh, we get into the nitty gritty of that at our website. We have sort of a prescribed definition of what a cultural organization is. Most of the organizations out there are already affiliated with the county through our other grant programs. So, um, but that's generally what the eligibility criteria is. And I'll just add. We didn't get a lot last year, but we got a small number of applications from houses of worship of all types of denominations uh, for 
capital work that needed to be done on their buildings, and we just made a decision that they were not 501c3 organizations, they were religious organizations, uh, and we did not want to get in a situation where we assisted one houses of worship, house of worship because then we would have created a, a situation where we would have had to done all houses of worship that wanted new doors, new roofs. So we're really keeping it to the arts and cultural uh, aspect. And the 501c3 is important. If you do not have a 501c3 status from the federal government, uh, you would not qualify. And religious organizations are handled by a different for, uh, part of the uh, Internal Revenue Code uh, and non-arts and cultural organizations uh, like business type organizations wouldn't qualify either. Any other questions on topic? If not, I'll ask my friends if they want to step aside, they can. Uh, I have a statement to read and then I'll take your questions. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in our community lately with regards to the possibility that asylum seekers would be moved into our community. Some have even called it a crisis. There is no crisis, at, simple as that. There may be a crisis at the southern border. Actually, there is a crisis at the southern border. And there may be a crisis in New York City, but there is no crisis in our community right now. As I discussed yesterday, Erie County, through our partners, uh, with the ref refugee resettlement community have a strong history of being able to uh, resettle, assimilate, or move on asylum seekers and refugees who move into our community, such that 12,000 have been moved through our community and either become members of our community or move onward just in the last decade alone. And that's from Erie County working with the department, Erie County Department of Social Services working with the refugee resettlement community, including uh, Journey's End, Refugee Services, Jericho Road, Community Health Center, which uh, runs Viva La Casa, uh, International Institute, Jewish Family Services, and Catholic Charities. All have played a role and are playing a role at this moment uh, with regards to uh, resettling of refugees into our community. We look at what we've seen in the last 10 years alone in the investment that has occurred in the city of Buffalo because of immigrant populations coming in here. I just think of the, the Broadway Fillmore area and how the Bengali community has invested not hundreds of thousands, but millions of dollars into a community that had really been set aside for years without any real investment. And now there are growing businesses and a growing population. We see the incredible turnaround in the city of Buffalo and Erie County with regards to communities that previously have been downtrodden, whether it be on the west side or the east side or individuals moving into other parts of our community. We have always been a welcoming community, and we will always be, at least if I'm the county executive, a welcoming community. Unless you are a Native American, all of us came from individuals who emigrated into this country. And up until 1921, anyone could show up. I am a descendant of Polish immigrants who came across in the 1908 and 1911. My great-grandfather also emigrated on my father's side from Bulgaria. My great-grandmother's parents emigrated from on my father's side of the part of the family from uh, Croatia. My mother's side of the family all emigrated from Poland at a time when you just showed up. You didn't have a paper, and you were either rejected at Ellis Island, or you were allowed in, and you became an American citizen. And looking across this room, I believe every one of us has a similar story like that, that our families came to this country to seek a brighter future for themselves and for their children. We've heard about the stories about individuals who've made thousand mile treks from their home with their children to find a better life in the United States based on the horror that they face at home. I just read a story about a, a pharmacy assistant. Pharmacy assistant, so this is a professional, trained individual who was making no more than $100 a month in Venezuela, who was facing the possibility of Venezuelan gangs holding her basically hostage for half of her income, and she made the trek with her five and six-year-old from Venezuela to the southern border of the United States 
to give those children an opportunity to lead a better life so that they would not be faced with gangs and no future going forward. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about giving individuals an opportunity for a better life as they've gone through one of the worst parts of their lives, a journey that they will never forget. And their descendants will always think about how grandma, grandpa, great grandma, great grandpa came to this country to give them a better life. I wanna to read to you a quote, it's a little long. It's from 1958. It was done by then Senator John F. Kennedy in his book, A Nation of Immigrants at a time in which there was this hype in the country about the terrible immigration that was coming across the border from Mexico and Puerto Rico, of which individuals were actually citizens of the United States. This is 1958. In just over 350 years, a nation of nearly 200 million people has grown up, populated almost entirely by persons who either came from other lands or whose forefathers came from other lands. As President Franklin D. Roosevelt reminded a convention of the Daughters of the American Revolution, remember, remember always that all of us, and you and I especially, are descendants from immigrants and revolutionists. Any great social movement leaves its mark and the massive migration of peoples to the new world was no exception to that rule. The interaction of disparate cultures, the vehemence of the ideals that led to the immigrants here, the opportunity offered by a new life all gave America a flavor and a character that make it as unmistakable and as remarkable to people today as it was to Alexis de Tocqueville in the early part of the 19th century. The contribution of immigrants can be seen in every aspect of our national life. We see it in religion, in politics, in business, in the arts, in education, even athletics and entertainment. There is no part of our nation that has not been touched by our immigrant background. Everywhere, immigrants have enriched and strengthened the fabric of American life. As Walt Whitman said, these states are the amplest poem. Here, is not merely a nation, but a teeming nation of nations. Senator John F. Kennedy wrote that in 1958. Our country has had re repeated waves of immigrants who have been treated horribly by the people that are called Americans. My descendants are my ancestors, I should say of Polish background, of Bulgarian background, of Croatian background. We're called horrible things. We're told they should not enter this country. The same happened to the Irish. The same happened to the Italians. The same has happened over and over and over again. What we're seeing in the United States is not something new. Unfortunately, I'd hoped we wouldn't see it again, but we are. And if we are to become the country that is inscribed on that plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty, we need to understand that we can only grow and become a better country by truly taking in people from all over the world. The cultural diversity of Buffalo and Erie County is something that we are proud of. When people come to this community, they're amazed by the cultural diversity and how at any moment they could go to a restaurant of their choosing from any background. That is what our community is made of. Today, we are being asked to potentially house individuals who've left their lives, their families, and their livelihoods to come to the United States for a better life. They've traveled thousands of miles, mostly on foot, through horrible, horrible situations to come to the United States, like that pharmacy assistant, to create a better life, not only for themselves, but for their children. Just like our forefathers and foremothers came to this country, leaving behind everything they knew to a country that didn't even speak their language in the hopes that they could live the American dream. That's exactly what we're talking about today. And I hope our community will be as welcoming as I believe it is, and what I've seen since we've announced, that we would welcome migrants to our community. Yes, there are those who are vocal, but I believe they are a vocal minority, not the majority of the people in this community. And as a result, 
we will do our best to ensure that these new Americans are truly new Americans that we can be proudly call neighbor, brother, and sister. Uh, some information, I did speak to the New York State Department of Homeland Security Emergency Services Commissioner today, Jackie Bray, and I can report that no final decision has been made yet by New York State. However, they are considering housing asylum seekers, also known as parolees, at Buffalo State University and possibly at the University of Buffalo. However, Buffalo State appears to be a better option because the asylum seekers would not have to be moved once the school year started. As they would be placed in dorms, the school will not be using for students. If they were to be moved in the short term to UB, they would actually then have to be moved out because there would be no room during the school year at the University of Buffalo, but there would be at Buffalo State. Any individual who would be moved here has turned themselves in at the border to federal authorities requesting asylum. I think that's very important to note. These individuals turn themselves in to federal authorities at the southern border requesting asylum. At that time, they were vetted by federal authorities, which includes fingerprinting and running criminal background checks connected with their home countries and any nations they may have passed through. I think this is very important to understand. The United States have relationships not only with Mexican, and I say the United States, the United States law enforcement like the FBI and other agencies have relationships with Mexican law enforcement just like they do with Honduran, Venezuelan, Ecuadorian, and they've run background checks and criminal checks on all of these individuals. If an individual criminal background check came up that they did have a criminal background, they would have been turned away and not allowed to travel to New York City. So there's a lot of unfortunate information out there saying, oh, these are all criminals coming here to rape our children and steal our jobs is false. There will be no one, if they're moved to our community, that has a criminal background they would not even have made it to New York City. Uh, I've been advised if they are moved by New York State, they would not be moved at least for the next week. Uh, we cannot speak for if we received earlier arrivals from New York City uh, as we've seen in some of the other counties where New York City did send a few busloads of individuals up to Orange and Rockland County, but New York State uh, would not have any individual arrive in our community at least for one week. Uh, we have ongoing communications with New York State as well as my office has been in touch with Mayor Eric Adams' office uh, these last couple weeks actually with regards to the possibility of uh, individuals being moved here by New York City. Uh, it may happen. Uh, I do anticipate that we will receive uh, asylum seekers, individuals who are legally in the country at this time uh, in our community. We have an incredible set of resources here available if needed, but the one thing that has been assured me is this would be paid for by New York State, if it's New York State, and New York City would pay for the cost associated with lodging, food, and other supportive services. They actually have a huge program that they've established in New York City alone that they would expand up here. Uh, as I said, this, is, this neighborhood, this community, this county, the, the Western New York region, unless you are a descendant of Native Americans like the Seneca Nation, all came from immigrants at one time or another. Sometimes we forget that. But each and every one of us descended from an individual who made a voyage that was very difficult, a journey that was exceptionally, exceptionally difficult, and some, of course, were forced to do it against their own volition because they were turned to slaves. Our community, our country, is the beacon of the world. If, so, if a mother of a five and a six-year-old is willing to walk a thousand miles through jungles, through difficult areas, knowing there's gangs looking for them, to give her children a better opportunity in the United States, who are we to say they shouldn't be here? That's the type of person who's gonna work hard, who's gonna create a better life not only for their family, 
but create a better life for our community. And we should welcome them. We will. With that, I'll open up to any questions. The, the question is in regards to all of the individuals in New York City, uh, have they all, all <laughs> uh, been vetted? I, I can't answer that question. All I've been told is the individuals who'd be moved here have all been vetted. And I think that's important to note, is that I, I can't speak for every individual. I'm not gonna say all 71,000 in New York City that have passed through. I believe there's about 40,000 right now in New York City is they've already moved through approximately 30,000 uh, individuals. Uh, but the ones that have been will, or will be moved here have been vetted through the process. Uh, and I will note, I mean, at any one time, it's not unusual for us to have a couple hundred refugee seekers, asylum seekers in our community. That's exactly what's going on right now. Uh, as I noted in my statement yesterday, we have uh, asylum refugee seekers, some of them who came up across the Mexican border from, uh, Afghanistan, the Congo, Ecuador, Ukraine, Venezuela. So we, we already have and we've had and we've processed them and they don't all stay here. Some of them go on to Canada, some of them have family elsewhere and they ended up being moved to that other community and some stay here. Uh, this is not our first day doing this. We, we actually have a very proud history. As I said, in the last decade alone, approximately 12,000 individuals have actually been moved through. But what's been told, given to me, told to me by the Commissioner of Emergency Services and Homeland Security for New York State is any individual that would be moved to Erie County will have been vetted by the federal government, and, and that's reassuring. Well, uh, the, the question was, what about the promise of not putting a cost? I've been told that the cost would be absorbed by New York City and, and New York State. Uh, the county annually invests in many of these organizations that do refugee resettlement. And so there's people today that are at Viva La Casa, which is part of Jericho Road Health uh, Community Health Center. We provide funding to Jericho Road Community Health Center. We always have, at least during my administration, and we will continue to do that just like we will support the other organizations that do refugee resettlement. The county's Department of Social Services is often involved in those cases, not always, but sometimes is, and we will continue to do that work too. Uh, the one thing that I feel heartened about is New York City and New York State have a system in place, so it's not as if they're just, which has been said, dumping people here. They have a system in place. They know who these individuals are, and uh, they, they've been providing them the supportive services. And I think that's important for people to know. It's not just like buses are coming up here and we don't even know who they are. They don't have any ID. They haven't been vetted. That is not the case. And as of right now, not a single individual has been moved here from New York City by New York State or New York City. So for those who are out there, this is a crisis. It's not a crisis. Uh, COVID was a crisis. The mass shooting was a crisis and how we responded to the need in our community. The blizzard was a crisis. This is not a crisis here. This is just one of the things that we deal with. Do you have any ongoing concerns or questions that you have to be made uh, to the state or questions you don't want to answer to the state? Is there any maximum capacity of number of folks you need to evacuate? Well, one of the things that at least talk in my conversations with New York State is uh, they know they have a limitation on the number of rooms that are available at Buff State or University of Buffalo. They prefer Buff State because they could keep them there during the time of the six months or so before they get work papers. The governor has advocated for a shortening of that period where work papers can be offered at which those individuals can then get jobs in our community. And there are thousands of jobs in available in our community, even though you may have seen, we had the lowest unemployment rate that anyone can ever hear of at 2.8% for the month of April. Uh, but there's still jobs available. And these are jobs often that locals don't want. But we see often the refugees uh, the, the asylum seekers, they'll take them because they want to get off social services. They don't want to be wards of the state. They want to work. They want to 
raise families. They want to buy houses. Uh, so I think the issue is we still don't know exactly how many, uh, but I feel, I feel at this point the vast majority of the questions have been issued, but that's a still one that's still up in the air and it's going to be dependent upon the uh, amount of lodging that's available. Uh, and then there is the issue of New York City, if they do bring a couple busloads up here, we've got plenty of ample hotel space to handle that. And there are hoteliers that want these people. They want these asylum seekers. For people who think, oh, they're going to be going to hotels that don't want them. There are hoteliers that would love to have this for a full year or more because it would be guaranteed income for them. No, I, 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 I'm very, I was disappointed to hear that a state of emergency has been declared by both Albany and Monroe, but I was at least heartened to hear that they didn't do exactly what a lot of the other counties have done and said, no, we're barring it. However, I still don't think an order like that is effective. There are certain things you can do is in using the public officer's law and issuing a state of emergency, preventing a private contract is not one of them. Uh, and as I said before, the I understand they're, they're, they're trying to get a plan in place, and we're all trying to get a plan in place, uh, but I, I don't necessarily think that order is going to be, if it passed judicial muster, I, I think it, it wouldn't. I'm glad at least to see that Albany and Monroe County said we are welcoming, we, would, we, don't, we don't mind, we're not going to prevent them from coming here, but I still think the emergency order is a little off. Uh, we are talking to the state, we're talking to New York City because we want to have a plan. And as, as I've been told by both New York City and New York State, nothing will happen in this community until we've been told what's happening so that we're aware of it. So that if, uh, it's just not gonna be buses showing up in the night. It's not gonna be. Uh, it, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna know if people are coming, how many and where they're going, what supportive services, if any, are gonna be required. Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, I, I feel confident in saying that we're just not going to see buses showing up in the middle of the night. So I think we'll have a plan in place. So whether these are legal or not, the governor has said he wants to send people to welcome in the community. Mm -hmm. So as you see these emergency orders out there, does that then create the expectation that more people will be coming to your county as well? Uh, I, I don't know. I'll say one thing that is, is, is a, a positive is they were expecting a mass amount of individuals showing up at the Mexican border with the expiration of Title 42, and that has not happened. They've actually seen a decrease in the number of individuals showing up at the Mexican, the southern border, uh, as a result of Title 42, and I think that's given some assurances that uh, the, it's not gonna be hundreds of thousands of people showing up at the border, where before they, I was hearing they were having 10,000 people showing up daily, then it went down to four, and then it was like three recently, uh, so at least Seeing the numbers decline uh, means that this is something that hopefully our, our, our country will be able to handle, unlike the thought that there were 100,000 people showing up on a day. Uh, so that, that, that's at least a good sign. Well, there was a question here. Yes, it, it, the question is what talk, walk through the logistics and is there a planning process? Yes, and that's one of the reasons why nobody showed up here at this point, is because they have to have a plan in place, not just here's where we're housing them, but how are we going to food them? How are we going to clothe them? If you're moving people into Buffalo, it's late May, that's great. What happens if they come from the border without anything and now they're here in September, <laughs> in October, and it starts getting colder out and they need to have different clothes? So yes, the planning is going on at this as I speak. Uh, when I actually talked to Commissioner Bray this morning, she was coming out of a meeting, which was another planning meeting, and she said she had another planning meeting herself. I will be going into an internal planning meeting very soon uh, between the county and our refugee uh, community uh, service uh, organizations who've all been invited to just, okay, what, what, what are the resources we have at the table right now? Uh, just as simple as, like, how many bars of deodorant do we have and things like that? So we just want to make certain if by chance more people showed up here of their own volition, not from New York State or 
uh, New York City, but they just show up here, and that's what happens. Every day people show up here. Uh, what do we have of our own capacity? And that work's been going on for some time, uh, but uh, I wanted to bring them all into a meeting in which I was at uh, so that we could at least understand where New York City and New York State are coming from and, and what the local community is capable of doing. Uh, the conversations I've had with leaders from the, the refugee resettlement community is uh, we stand at the ready. We know how to do this. We probably know how to do it better than other places in New York State outside of New York City because we've had thousands of people come through our community in the last few years alone. And uh, I don't remember there being a crisis as a result of that. All I see is a better community uh, with a lot more restaurant options. <laughs> Uh, I have to know, I mean, we're talking about state institutions, Buffalo State University, University of Buffalo. Uh, the state owns them, so they have the right to place individuals there. They are having those conversations. Uh, we are being advised of, of how that's pro progressing, and those conversations are going on right now. Uh, right now, my understanding is they're trying to figure out how many people they could successfully place here without causing a problem. Uh, and at that time, I think then they're going to have those conversations with local leaders. Do you Sandra? Know what the capacity is, capacity is? I don't. I'd have to, you have to ask that question to the state. And when you say that you're not the what exactly is I've been advised by the commissioner that they would not be here for at least seven days. It's possible. It's possible. From today, it's possible we could have arrivals within two weeks, but not in the next week. Uh, any individual who thinks we're going to be less for them is just wrong. Uh, the county government, our county finances are strong. Uh, we had a very, very substantial budget surplus last year, and uh, we've trended the first few months with a budget surplus. Uh, that this will not require a tax increase or anything like that. We've reduced the tax levy many, many years in a row, so now it's at the lowest level, or not the tax levy, the, <laughs> Sandra's gonna look at me, and the tax rate. <laughs> we've reduced the tax rate uh, many, many years in a, in a row uh, to where it's now the lowest tax rate uh, on record. Uh, so anyone who's like, oh, they're going to tax me more, or they're going to take away my services, that is not the case. That is just not the case. We've done this before. I think that's the thing to remind people. Uh, I ran into someone on the street a couple days ago. It's like, I can't believe we'd be taking in immigrants. I said, we already do. And they're like, what are you talking about? I go, we've taken thousands in, in, in the last few years. And you know that great restaurant you like to go to Burmese? When did you think they, they, the, the Burmese came here in the last 10 to 15 years, or the Somali restaurant? Or you, you want to go, and, you, and they even the person mentioned, yeah, I saw that new, uh, that new strip mall on Broadway near the Broadway market. I go, yeah, that came from the Bengali community who didn't even exist here 10 years ago. We've been taking in immigrants constantly. It's one of the great things about the city of Buffalo and Erie County. And what I love about it is so diverse. And I've been across the United States where it's pretty homogeneous. Everyone's the same. At least they think they're the same. This is really diverse. Makes it a great community. And uh, for those who are like, oh, we're going to have some immigrants here, it's going to take away from me. No, it won't. And if you want the proof about it, in the last 10 years, we've had over 10,000 or 12,000 refugees pass through our community, and it didn't take a penny away from them in the past. Uh, the, the question for those who might not have heard is, if, are you upset about federal leadership and how this is being passed on to local leaders? Yeah, I'm not happy about it. This has to be solved at a federal level. Uh, it requires Democrats and Republicans to come together, and unfortunately, they just like to smack each other over the head, but they need to solve this problem. Uh, and it is solvable. It is not something that just is just you can't ignore, but it is solvable. And local governments have to pick up their share a lot when things are unable to be done on the on the federal level. It happens quite often. Uh, I have a very good relationship with the Biden administration. 
I, I know quite a number of individuals in the administration, and, and they're very receptive when we talk to them, and I, they realize it themselves. And this just is not a Biden administration issue. This is also a congressional issue. This is, right now we have a House that's Republican, a Senate that's Democrat, and a White House that's Democratic. And I think people need to understand that they all need to come together to solve this. And building a wall is not the only answer. There are other answers out there with regards to ensuring uh, the border is secure, as well as that we have an opportunity to uh, allow people to come to our country to, uh, to better themselves. This will be the last question. I was very disappointed in what some of my county colleagues did because I felt that the orders were illegal and immoral. They may have problems in their community, but we get elected to solve problems, not ignore them. And I was disappointed in some of my county colleagues. I'm the president of the New York State Association of County Executives this year. And right now, there's a few county executives who don't want to talk to me. So be it. We get elected to solve problems. Uh, how many of you remember, and it wasn't that long ago, I think it was in my first term, when we ended up, there was, we were going to get Syrian refugees from the crisis that was going on in Syria. And there were members of our community, including some legislators in the Erie County Legislature, who said, you have to stop these terrorists, these Syrians, from coming into our community. And I was like, no, we're going to welcome them. We're going to show them that this is their new home. What happened? We got a whole bunch of new Americans, but nothing bad happened. And I remember that because I, there were some people, and some people were advising me politically, oh, Mark, you shouldn't touch this issue. You shouldn't be saying we're going to be welcoming the Syrians because automatically people are saying, oh, they're terrorists. Nothing bad happened. We opened up our community to Syrian refugees, some who stayed here, some who moved elsewhere. But now they're new Americans, and they will remember how they were treated in Buffalo and Erie County. And I'm hoping that the individuals, when they come here, and I believe they will, will remember how they were treated in Buffalo and Erie County. And when they become American citizens, and they proudly show up that certificate of American citizenship, they will treat people the same way that we treated them. And we will be a better community for it, a better country for it. With that, thanks everyone, have a good day.